ayes have it. The next item of business is a motion from the Committee for Infrastructure on concerns over COVID-19 guidance and financial support to industry sectors. I will ask the clerk to please read the motion. That this Assembly recognises the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the taxi, haulage, driving instruction and private hire bus and coach sectors, acknowledges that these industries have not been prioritised in terms of guidance and support packages, and calls on the Minister for Infrastructure to bring forward proposals for the formulation of guidance and financial support for these sectors as a matter of urgency. Thank you. I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Infrastructure, Ms Michelle McElveen, to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has allowed one and a half hours for this debate. Ms McElveen will have ten minutes to propose the motion and ten minutes to, wa to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. I ask Ms McElveen to please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And as we are all acutely aware, the COVID pandemic has had an adverse impact on almost all aspects of our lives. Over recent months, the Committee for Infrastructure has had a role in examining this impact on the individuals and organisations that fall under the remit of the Department for Infrastructure. The Committee has discussed and scrutinised the range of mitigations put in place for sectors hardest hit by the pandemic and has wholeheartedly supported proposals brought forward to assist these sectors. However, the Committee is aware of a number of industries who feel that they have been let down at this time. These industries, in desperation and hope, have voiced their concerns to the Department for Infrastructure. However, adequate support has not been forthcoming or been unsatisfactory. In this motion, the Committee wishes to add its voice to the frustrations of some of those sectors so badly impacted by the pandemic and ask for members' support in calling on the Minister for Infrastructure to bring forward financial support and guidance to assist the individuals involved in the sectors outlined in this motion. I intend to outline my committee's engagement with these sectors, the issues raised during this engagement, and the insufficient response received from the Minister to date. The committee has considered correspondence from these sectors since the beginning of the lockdown. For example, in correspondence of 9 April 2020, representatives of taxi drivers asked the committee for its help. While appreciating these are unprecedented times and understanding the pressures facing departments, they voiced their concern that the taxi industry, both public and private, have received little or no guidance and support while providing an essential service to some of our most vulnerable citizens. They told the committee that they had raised their issues with government, but still had questions about the availability of government grant available to help the taxi industry. The committee sought answers from the minister, who responded, advising that her department's responsibility only extends to taxi industry regulation. The Minister acknowledged that the financial package announced by the Government in Westminster fell short of what was needed. The Minister advised that she was engaging with the Economy Minister and she understood the Department for the Economy is responsible and would be issuing guidance. With the Minister's view that it is the responsibility of other departments, the taxi industry continued to ask for the Committee's help. Writing to the Committee again on the 17th and 29th of June, they highlighted the serious impact COVID-19 had had been having and outlined how their industry has been decimated with the majority having to stop work due to a lack of demand as a result of lockdown. They called again for urgent financial help and support. The taxi industry asked the Minister to issue grants to help taxi drivers under the Northern Ireland Taxi Act 2008. However, the Minister for Infrastructure responding to the committee reiterated that her department's responsibility is solely regulation of the taxi industry, not financial assistance. In her opinion, the Taxi Act does not extend to providing general financial support grants to the taxi industry in times of hardship. However, the Economy Minister advised the committee that regarding to a specific support package for the taxi industry, Schedules 1 and 3 to the Budget Act 2020 allocate funding to the Department for Infrastructure for transport licensing, enforcement and regulation, as well as support for, for transport services, including grants, in respect of rail and road passenger services, including fare concessions. The Economy Minister pointed out her belief that taxis are clearly regarded as transport services. Writing to the committee on the 29th of June, the taxi industry once again outlined their concerns, calling on the Minister for Infrastructure to put forward a specific proposal to the Finance Minister or refer the matter to the Executive so the taxi industry can be supported by government through a hardship fund. Many drivers have installed screens within their vehicles at their own expense, but are concerned about whether their vehicles will pass the PSV test with the addition of this new equipment. 
It should be noted that a number of councils in England and Scotland have supplied funding for or provided PPE kits to taxi drivers. On the 28th of May, the Committee for Infrastructure wrote three letters to the Finance Minister seeking financial support for the road haulage industry, the taxi industry and the transport sectors in general. In his response, the Finance Minister advised that he had engaged with his executive colleagues on these matters as well as with the Department for Transport, Treasury and Industry representatives. The Finance Minister noted that the British Government has taken the view that given the range of measures already put in place, including the support package to maintain ferry routes, a road haulage specific intervention was not needed at this time. The Finance Minister also noted that the Department for Infrastructure had not made any bids to his department for support for the taxi industry and encouraged it to do so, not at this time, thank you. He outlined that £59.5 million of the funding set aside by the Executive for the Transport Sector had not yet been allocated. In response to a letter to DOF and DFE on the need for financial support to taxi drivers, the Finance Minister provided a list of COVID support schemes to which those in the taxi industry could apply. However, there was also an acknowledgement that many drivers have not been able to access the schemes available. As for a financial support package for the road haulage and logistics sector, it was a similar story, with the infra infrastructure minister taking the view that her department was only responsible for the regulation of the industry. And through this rule, she had introduced a number of regulatory measures to aid the transport and logistics sector. The Minister also identified that the Department for Transport has been liaising with the, Royal, or the Road Haulage Association and Freight Transport Association to ensure that the key objectives of maintaining critical supply routes and supporting economic recovery are achieved. Regarding an, a Northern Ireland package of support, the Minister advised that any request for financial support for the road freight sector should be made by the Department for the Economy. The RHA and FTA provided oral and written briefings to the committee on the amendment of le legal requirements that they have sought to enable them to continue to provide their vital role in keeping supply chains operating. These changes include extending drivers' um, daily driving and delivery hours, vehicle MOTs, driving licences and medical examinations to ensure the continuation of vital supplies required by all within Northern Ireland. In response to the committee concerns, the Department advised that the Department for Transport has been liaising with RHA and FTA to understand the up-to-date picture for road hauliers at a local and UK-wide level. The FTA weekly survey of the first week of April 2020 reported that businesses were experiencing the following. 82% general downturn in business with work orders cancelled, 34% had gone out of business, 20% of HGV drivers and warehouse staff were not able to work due to the virus, and 32% were experiencing moderate to severe difficulties finding fitters, mechanics and technicians. The RHA and FTA detailed how some elements of the sector are surviving. However, there are operators in other sectors, for example, one operator who has a mixed fleet of vehicles worth £6 million parked up. They are relatively new vehicles and the depreciation on the vehicles alone is in the region of £100,000 per month. With the vehicles parked up for over three months, that is a loss of over £300,000 in value, not taking into consideration the lost income. The committee and I am sure many members have also heard from driving instructors feeling forgotten and invisible during this pandemic. Some have tried to work out their own safety measures with little to no guidance. They have no idea. Sorry, let me continue, please. They have no idea when they should return to work, and they are in dire jeopardy of failing with many job losses. In response, once again, the Minister and the Department has advised the committee that it should look elsewhere for answers, advising that the Department has no remit over driving instructors or when they might return to work. Adding to the confusion that driving instruction was not specifically covered in the COVID-19 recovery plan, nor were driving instructors specifically listed in any of the schedules to the Health Protection Coronavirus regula Restrictions Regulations or in subsequent amendments. There is still no indication when driving tests can resume. Without testing, instruction is pointless, and this needs to be addressed immediately. Again, in response to committee questions about the coach and bus hire sector, the Minister has, had little, has offered little support other than continuing to take action in relation to its regulatory responsibilities and directing this sector to the general pandemic business support measures. While other committee members will give more specifics on, um, on detail of the challenges, 
I hope I have given members a sense of the abandonment felt by these sectors, so integral to the work and responsibilities of the Department for Infrastructure. Unfortunately, the Minister has failed to be the champion the, the transport sectors needed during the pandemic by attempting to pass her departmental responsibilities to others. I'm disappointed that there's an amendment to the motion today. Throughout the discussions in the committee, there was a unity of purpose in attempting to seek a solution to the various challenges facing these industries. These are employers, breadwinners and vital cogs in our transport excuse me, infrastructure who feel genuine fear of debt and job loss. They're not interested in the politicking within this chamber. And what they're looking for is someone to lead. And I hope this, this House can support this motion to call on the Minister for Infrastructure to genuinely listen to the concerns and be that person. Thank you. Thank you. I call Dolores Kelly to move the amendment. Five minutes. No, just move first. Oh, sorry. Uh, so moved. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you'll have ten minutes to propose and five minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes. Can I ask you to open the debate on the amendment? Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's attendance uh, for the debate because the Minister has led from the front, and it's very clear to see that there are some people regretfully po politicising uh, statutory committees. Uh, the, the fact that there is an amendment to a committee motion should, should speak to that, and we have cross-party support on that basis. There is a, a deliberate misdirection and deliberate confusion. For a start, in relation uh, to all of the sectors, everyone here, I'm sure, uh, feel a great debt of gratitude to those people who continue to work uh, throughout the health pandemic. And we all know that many people worried about their health their jobs and their livelihoods. And as we're facing into potentially the worst economic recession we've ever known, many people's fears uh, continue unabated. But from the outset, this minister has led for the front within the purview of her ministerial responsibilities. She has amended the regulation. She has listened to the haulage sector, to the driving instructors, to the taxi industry. And, and Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have to say, when we talk about the taxi industry, you know, who exactly are we speaking of? Because I have checked with all of my colleagues across the Northern Ireland, and as I understand it, the majority of the taxi industry folk who actually have a problem with what the Minister has done are centred around North and West Belfast. Because I, my office in Lurgan is beside a taxi company, and it does not, I have not received a single complaint. Because the fact is, they, they, all of those self-employed sectors have been able to av uh, avail of the financial support offered by the Minister for the Economy. They, they, uh, we are told in an answer to a ministerial question that to date over 30 taxi firms have availed of the uh, financial support package. Others have availed of the furlough schemes across all of the sectors mentioned. And indeed, uh, there are others who have also availed and will be availing of the rates holiday and the uh, tax deferment of payment break that has been announced as well. Now, there are sectors uh, that have had specific financial uh, uh, packages made available to them, but they've made available by the executive by the economy minister and sometimes through the finance minister in work with another colleague. On more than one occasion, the committee was told that the minister of the, of the Department of Infrastructure had no varies to make financial supports available. None. So what this motion is actually seeking uh, and what people are failing to listen and to hear is that the minister of infrastructure has no power to give financial support grants. And the, the committee has had lengthy correspondence trails uh, that the Minister of Infrastructure wrote to her executive colleagues asking for specific help. Now, if I can deal with the issue of guidance for the driving instructors, no, I won't. You'll have plenty to say later on. The driving instructors, no, I won't. Uh, the driving instructors, we were told by a permanent, the, the head of DVA at committee, I asked specifically who had responsibility for the driving instructors. They were self-employed. 
And I have been approached by driving instructors. I have corresponded, with the, corresponded and given the best advice available to me to give to them. But I'm very clear that driving instructors uh, are self-employed. Their guidance was on the website for the Department of the Economy. The minister here has responsibility for driving examiners, an entirely different kettle of fish, you might say, especially if you're the one doing the test. But can I say then, in relation to uh, the, um, the furlough scheme and the haulage sectors, uh, you can see the minister has, alongside the finance minister, corresponded with the Department of Transport and put in place whatever measures and opportunities to try to prote protect the ferry routes. Excuse me. Now, unfortunately, the ferry companies decided to keep all of that financial package for themselves and didn't pass on a reduction to the haulage sector. And that is regrettable. And it's something I'm sure that the Department of Transport and the ministers here have raised with them in, in, individually. But, that, but that's the fact of the matter. The issue around uh, guidance for taxi drivers, I looked it up myself because I heard what the taxi uh, instructors were saying. And I also wanted to find out uh, so that I could pass on information to driving instructors. Lo and behold, I looked up the Department of the Economy website, and where was it? It was on, the guidance was on the Department of the Economy's website, because that's where the guidance comes from. Again, a self-employed sector. So, Mr. De Principal Deputy Speaker, we, we have um, great difficulties with the motion because it is leading to confusion, it is misdirecting, and it's not serving the people that they actually have said that they seek to serve and to get the best for. Because if we were being honest and truthful with all of those sectors, we would give them the right information at the right time and send them to the right ministers in order to get the help that they need. We wouldn't send them up the garden path in order for us to make our own uh, political point scoring available to them. So the, the SDLP amendment, and uh, we want to recognise the facts that this matter is not simply for DFI, where there is very clear regulatory responsibility. And if I can give the House some indication of some of the decisions that the Minister took within her area of responsibility. The Minister wrote to Minister Murphy in, uh, and Minister Dodds seeking information and advice as to whether it was specific, uh, specific support and financial assistance that the industry could access. Again and again, Minister Mallon wrote to the Executive stressing that there was a need to ascertain what financial support could be made to the industry. Minister Mallon also wrote to the Minister for Communities asking if taxis could be redeployed to support the industry to help support the COVID-19 fight back. Responses from the Sinn Féin ministers. Minister Mallon was assured there was support for taxi drivers. She was assured that a Sinn Féin minister was exploring options for redeployment. Now, perhaps people should ask what happened, what redeployment opportunities presented themselves of the Sinn Féin minister with responsibility. Minister Dodds not only wrote to Minister Mallon, but in answers to MLAs, she clearly pointed out that she was providing guidance for the taxi industry. So the taxi industry has a field of support. I'm mindful, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have to address the issue around uh, coach and private hire. It is my understanding that the Minister for the Economy will be making the provision because they're part of that wider hospitality task force group that, that is, has been uh, asked to look at options that might be available for them. So I hope that there will be good news coming to that particular sector, because we all know that with the drop off in tourism, especially from outside of here, that that has had an adverse impact. On, on that sector. But I think it is most regrettable in all my years, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, committees have spoken with one voice. We haven't generally created divisions, and it's very clear to see where the party political point scoring is coming from and where some people are looking greater, greater focus on some industries and not others. And you'd have to ask why some specific industries in particular they're seeking to support. But uh, I think the message is uh, we all want the executive, uh, if there are opportunities, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, 
for the executive to help in any way, in any particular loophole, in any gap that needs filled, then I think the, I would ask the members of this House to support our amendment to the motion and that we act with one voice uh, very briefly. Yes, um, I don't really want to get involved in the ping pong between which executive party is to blame, although I have my own view about that. But surely it is a collective failure of the executive because these are may well be cross-cutting issues. And the haulage sector, which I'm particularly concerned, has been hung out to dry by virtue of the failure of the executive parties to apply for a pot of money which is sitting in finance, presently £29 million, and there has no, been no collective decision to make an application for that. Is it not therefore an executive failure, never mind individual departments? Well, um, I want to be fair, Minister, or Principal Deputy Speaker, to all of the ministers around the table. This is a global pandemic, the like of which we have never seen before, and ministers had to step up very quickly, not only to their brief, but to the challenges presented by the health pandemic. And I think, by and large, many of them have worked well, but there is a lack of transparency in how some sectors get supported more quickly than others. But I would urge the executive to fill the gaps in the haulage sector, in the coach and private hire sector, and the tax Whatever sector, we feel all workers deserve to be supported in these most challenging and trying of times. And I commend the amendment to the House. Thank you. I call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Boylan, Lord Chavalver, our son in Ruin Shaw, I speak in favour of the motion and welcome the motion from the committee. And it's it's like everything else. The, the member would take a, uh, an intervention for some other member, but wouldn't take it from herself. The, the, issue, the issue here, and she, she mentioned herself because she said this was people should step up in a pandemic, and this is exactly what it is. And there's a lot of other ministers right across the board who hadn't got the various to do things, but stepped up and come up with plans and come up with ideas. And the reason, and, and the, it's the member who's a rear guard action now to protect her own minister. Because this was discussed in the committee. A lot of members who, funny enough, who are going to support maybe your amendment today actually were content within the committee system to speak out and were happy with some of the responses we got. And still, not today, when they get up to speak, they will go against what they'd said in committee itself. Mr. Begg supported Mr. Murphy in committee when he said in this floor here that bring proposals forward to the executive and we'll have a discussion because he mentioned the committee and all the members had said other things. And they, were, and they were content. And they were content for that. The, the whole point of it was this: we were saying to the minister, "Yes, bring forward proposals." But we, as a committee, would support you. We are not the ones who was ding dong and right across the ministers. The minister sits there with the database of the number of taxi licences and all the licences across the board. And all we were saying at the time was, "Put that on a bit of paper, bring it to the executive, and then we shall discuss it." Because, because the industry out there look to the infrastructure minister, they don't look to the economy or finance or the executive, and I appreciate what Mr Alice is saying in a certain package of money, but if you talk to taxi drivers, bus operators, no matter, they look towards the DFA minister as their minister. And what all we were saying as a committee was bring forward proposals, we would support you in working with other ministers as a package and the, listening to some of the industry. And I do agree with Ms Kelly, there are some people who have been, sorry, who have, sorry, uh, Mr Figger, um, I do agree that there are industries, or some parts and sectors of the industry, were facilitated within some of the schemes. But I have asked the Finance Minister, he said the proposals weren't brought forward, he said if they were brought forward, we would have a discussion at the executive, and the executive made the uh, decision. I asked the infrastructure minister to work with the economy minister to bring forward proposals, and she came back, and they were ding dong between whose responsibility it was. So I've received two letters saying from the economy minister that the remit lies within the FA, and that's not what this motion is about. The motion is that we, as a committee, the majority of the committee, would support proposals brought to the executive, and that's still our position on. And I was <laughs> a whole prepared speech with a number of issues that brought up this, but the member, the, some members have already brought the issues. 
and for Miss Kelly to say there's only certain sectors of the taxis industry. I know people within my own constituency got it hard and getting it very hard and applied for some schemes and didn't. So the, the real point in all of this and the real discussion in all of this, Mr Speaker, is that if we're in a pandemic and all we're saying is if people are really going to step up, we'll let them step up. But I just want to bring the Minister one thing because Ms Kelly there was praising her glories there. The Minister actually found the time in the issue of the airports, if we can find it here, in relation to the airports, she found time to work well. In the Minister's own words, she states that while my powers are limited on airports, working with colleagues on the Department for Transport, I have been able to secure this unique payment to support the airports at this difficult time. It is this type of collaborative working that will get us through this crisis and our recovery from it. And I couldn't agree more, Minister. Sorry. I couldn't agree more, Minister, through you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Sorry, sir. Sorry. I couldn't agree more. And all we are saying is bring a proposal, use the data on the database. If it's a case of working data across different departments, which I, I can't say it's not a cross cutting measure, I don't disagree with that. But bring proposals. We will support you. It'll be an executive decision. And that's what this motion is about. And for Ms. Kelly to say uh, that motions from committees in the past have been, have been unanimously agreed. This here, the majority of people agreed this motion. Unfortunately, Ms. Kelly wasn't there at the time of the discussions on it. But I will be supporting the motion and going against the amendment. Mr. Roy Beggs. I rise to support the amendment. And I also can support the main motion. I am indicating a preference for the amendment, and I will explain uh, myself uh, during the course of this discussion. Um, undoubtedly, those who have been involved uh, in a variety of industries, such as the coach tour operators, ordinary coach operators, taxi drivers, HGV drivers, and driving instructors, had the, have been severely adversely affected over the past number of months. Some have been infected to varying degrees, and I'll come back to that later. There are a number of support schemes uh, that are available, as have been indicated, for self-employed. So putting any scheme together to provide additional support will need to be very carefully worked out to avoid duplication. What we don't want to be doing is double funding somewhere and then not giving funding to someone else. So it's clear in my mind that we'll need to be very close cooperation and working with the economy minister, who actually has brought the vast majority of schemes that have been assisting uh, the, those who have been working in Northern Ireland forward, particularly uh, those in self-employment. So because they have been uh, uh, in that central position, I certainly view that they have a role going forward. In addition, I understand that there is a detailed work going on looking at how we can assist the tourism industry uh, recover from this epidemic. And I understand there's a separate work stream looking at tour coach operators. So it's very important that we don't cr create a double funding and double, uh, a double mechanism uh, of, of support. Uh, and that's why I had a preference for uh, the executive working together, the two departments working together and bringing forward an executive-led scheme with the money on offer, there's no point somebody bringing uh, forward a scheme that's not going to be funded. Uh, it's discussion with the Department of Finance as well to assist those in need. There has been huge variation in how uh, uh, different drivers have been affected. Uh, those giving driving lessons have had no work, impossible to work. In the HGV industry, uh, if you were Working in the construction sector, you had virtually no work because many construction sites closed down. How are, well, indeed. The member given way, but I'm sure he, like me, will acknowledge the, the reason was because of the nature of the virus that those, those, that close working was, was prohibited. The member has an, I, member has an additional minute. I, I, fully, I fully accept that, uh, but I'm just trying to demonstrate some uh, had no work. Others, those involved in the food retailing industry, I understand food retailing went up 30 per cent, so the hauliers involved in food retailing were probably busier than ever. 
So, so there is a variety uh, of workload that would have uh, resulted with a range uh, of those serving the economy in terms of transport. Taxi drivers, again, work would have virtually dried up completely. Thankfully, some is emerging again, and direction has been given to try and assist them to assist key workers and also the, the general public. But I do recognise that the Department for, Rural, uh, or for Regional Development can have a, play a significant role here. It is they who have access to tachographs. And if, people, if a scheme were wanting to be put together which could show the level of business that each individual operator had during this period, to me that would seem to be an obvious route. So the, so the Department of Regional Development can play a role in this. And that's why I, I, I think that they, they have a significant role to play. I would express a preference that it should be an executive-led scheme uh, involving all relevant departments and ensuring that we will avoid duplication and get best value from our public funds to help those at the coalface who need support. Thank you. Mr Andrew Muir. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the motion presented from the Infrastructure Committee today rightly refers to a number of uh, business sectors in need of support but who have struggled to obtain grant assistance in many instances by the three schemes established by the Department of the Economy to date, namely the 10K, the 25K and the Hardship Fund Coronavirus Business Grant Support Schemes, delivered, I note, under the 1982 Industrial Development Order. I have engaged with many businesses and people in these sectors over recent weeks and months and know that many are desperate for support. They are crying out for assistance and looking to Stormont for help. While some hauliers have managed to get through the pandemic without major financial stress, those without contracts with, for example, major supermarkets are teetering on collapse. Business virtually collapsed during the pandemic and is now only a fraction of what it was prior to March. With leases still to pay, furloughing being phased out from next month, and loan payments due and utilities bills still arriving, the future is stark. News that are much hoped for joint package of support would not be forthcoming from the Department for Transport in London and the Executive in Northern Ireland felt like a kick in the teeth, especially for those who were waiting for this money to arrive and that the funding was already set aside. Just because DFT and HM Treasury do not want to proceed uh, does not mean that we can't act in Northern Ireland. We can and should deliver a tailored package of support for those hardest hit. Most taxi drivers, like driving instructors, couldn't access the grant schemes set up by the Department of the Economy because of the relationship with the non-domestic rating system and the exclusion of sole traders from the hardship fund criteria, leaving them only with recourse to the self-employed income support scheme, if eligible, and no support for the overheads and bills which still keep arriving. Both guidance and support has been slow and lacking and must be addressed if we are to build back our economy, recognising the valuable role both play in helping get us about. Like driving instructors and taxi drivers, trade for private bus and coach operators has also largely dried up in recent months. At this point, I should declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Yes? Thank you. You may be aware that there is a meeting today in Belfast of the, the coach operators and, and obviously I have had some discussion with some of the local uh, coach operators in my own constituency and, and the issue of regulation falls within the Department of Infrastructure and the plea that is coming from this motion and from this House today is for the Minister to recognise that there needs to be, I think as the, the proposal of the motion stated, leadership given on this issue to make a recommendation so that particularly uh, the coach operators actually get financial assistance. The member has an additional minute. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'll refer to the point you have just raised later in my speech. Often reliant upon tourism business in spring, summer and autumn seasons, 2020 is viewed as by many within the private bus and coach business as a complete write-off. But with furloughing being phased out and payments still due for fleets locked up in yards across Northern Ireland, a financial bridge to 2021 is essential. Without it, I fear rebuilding our tourism offer will be extra, extra hard next year. The case for action and support for these sections is therefore clear. That is not in dispute. Let me be crystal clear. Taxi, haulage, driving instruction and private bus and coach sectors and many more have been excluded from the grant assistance necessary to get through this pandemic. It is wrong and it must be addressed. 
But by passing the motion worded today, I fear all we will be doing is raising false hopes that the wrongs will be righted. As I suspect the Minister will detail in her response, the Department for Infrastructure does not feel it has the varies to distribute the grant assistance needed. Uh, yes. Would the member not agree that, besides the various issue, which I, which I do agree with, are you saying that the Minister has not the capacity to bring forward proposals or any suggestions to try and address this issue? I think the varies is actually quite an important issue because it's a legal issue about whether you can actually give out the money. Um, and I have asked the questions and I have got the responses and I have no reason to believe that I'm being misled. By passing the motion today unamended, you would, in essence, be asking a fish to climb a tree, and I'm reluctant to do that. To those who state the Department in charge of regulation and to whom you pay your fees, no, you pay your fees and taxes should give the support. I think your logic is flawed. If followed through, then you should abolish the Department of the Economy and this, uh, uh, use the Department of Finance to give out all the grant support. I would urge members to support the amendment table as a real and practical way of getting the assistance to these sectors that need it. To say that the executive cannot come together and so so sort out the issue shows a real lack of confidence that ministers can come together, develop solutions and govern together. In 2020, that is what I and others expect. New decade, new approach. It ought to be the norm, to be honest, where each minister governs to support each other as equals, rather than passing people from pillar to post. Get around the table, sort out the issue should be the message today, not to point and pin blame on one minister and one department. Thank you very much, Mr Pinsley, Deputy Speaker. Mr Keith Buchanan. Deputy Speaker, and just before I open my prepared speech here, I think it's important anybody listening from outside don't care about the politics. If they're driving a bus or lorry, they want support and they want financial support. They don't, they don't get into the politics of it. So I think it's important for anybody listening to this debate. So first of all, I want to raise in support of this motion seeking guidance and financial support to the industry, and I will not be supporting the amendment. The COVID-19 crisis has massively impacted a varied range of ground transportation businesses, including coaching, taxi, driving instruction and haulage activities to such an extent that for many their income is more or less non-existent. Public transport has received support, but many within the coach, taxi, driving instruction and haulage industry are self-employed and small family-run businesses and have been left out. Taxi drivers have been unable to obtain clear guidance regarding protective equipment. The taxi industry and its drivers have been left without adequate protection and guidance despite some Working throughout the lockdown, many operators have reported a 70 to 80 per cent downturn in business. Taxi drivers cannot do their job from home, and their job makes it hard to social distance, but they are also self employed, so need to work. While some drivers can claim the government's self employment income support scheme worth 80 per cent of their trading profits, many are not eligible for this scheme. At the Committee for Infrastructure on the 10th of June, it was highlighted that the Minister for in of Finance was clear that his department had not received any bids for support for the taxi industry. In response to this point, Mr McGrath, Department of Infrastructure, said, and I quote, there simply is not enough money to cover the current pressures, and there may well be other pressures. Not every need can be met. My Minister has a view that she has no responsibility for financing of the taxi industry. Many owners and operators within the coach industry say that without financial support to withstand the current crisis, their industry in Northern Ireland will face severe financial hardship and the jobs will be placed at risk. With the cancellation of holidays by coach within Northern Ireland, UK, Ireland and further afield, many uh, private coach companies will struggle to remain in business. Many cannot access the support directed at the leisure sector, despite being an integral part of the tourism industry. Their business is highly seasonal, with March and September being the peak, meaning the peak season will be non-existent this year. This will leave them in a vulnerable position as they travel from 2020 into 2021, as the winter months are always less profitable. Many had bookings throughout the summer season and have been obliged to offer cash refunds to those who have requested them. Operators have invested heavily in their operations to maintain good fleet, reduce breakdowns and encourage people to use the coach. Even each vehicle has a huge standing cost. Purchasing, insuring, maintaining and these costs still need to be covered during the pandemic. As with many within the service industry and leisure and tourism businesses, the coach industry seeks to provide the best service possible, and this includes the up, upkeep of their fleet. Many businesses have purchased new coaches, 
with finance on them as the payments on this finance continue. The depreciation on these vehicles is accelerating as the second-hand coach market becomes flooded as operators' businesses collapse. I have been contacted by numerous driving instructors who are incredibly frustrated with the lack of guidance given to them by DVA. Unlike their counterparts in the mainland who were supported and advised throughout the lockdown period, rather than helping, DVA caused more confusion with the emails sent to them on Saturday the 27th of June, advising that they were not specifically mentioned in the list of businesses in the regulations that were closed down. To comply with social distancing and the nature of the task, of course these businesses were going to close, and of course they were going to look to DVA to advise how and when they could return to work. Speaking to a number of them yesterday, I am told that they have around six to eight hours instruction booked this week without a date for testing, which is, the, which is in the gift of the Minister. These businesses are not sustainable. This is not good enough, and these businesses need clarity. The haulage industry is suffering with a reduction in backloads from the mainland, lower level of business, but still paying fixed costs to the lorry fleet. Some of the aforementioned transport businesses have received payment holidays from the financial institutions, but this is only a stopgap and will not help this sector in the long term. The member to my right referred to a fish climbing a tree. But I think if the fish got some help or guidance, maybe it could have an attempt to climb that tree. It is not impossible. So I want to conclude that I now call on the Minister to look at the schemes to support these forgotten businesses within this sector. Fish climbing trees. <laughs> I call Miss Liz Kimmins. And I had a prepared speech, but I suppose a lot of the points have been covered, so I don't want to, to go over old ground, but I think the majority of us are on the same page on this. And I think it's important just to clarify, and, and, and following on from Mr Muir's um, comments, we are not asking the Minister to hand out the money on this. We are asking her to lead, as, as having responsibility for transport policy, to lead on these issues and to provide clear guidance and bring proposals to the right people um, on this. Um, and I go back to Ms Kelly's comments, and, and I can't go on without mentioning this. I think it's actually it's quite unfair to say that the only complaints are coming from North and West Belfast in terms of taxi drivers. That's not the case in my constituency, and I would like to ask her um, possibly later to, to reflect on that and, and why that, that would be an issue if that was the case. What was the implication there? Um, because I, I want of the impression that all taxi drivers are, are um, entitled to raise their concerns, not not if they're from North Belfast, West Belfast, Newry, Straban, wherever. They all have the entitlement to raise their concerns. Um, others have, have mentioned the taxi drivers, the private bus operators. I want to, to focus on the hauliers and pick up on some of the points around driving instructors. I've engaged locally, particularly with uh, hauliers in my own constituency, some of whom have vehicles hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging money, hundreds of vehicles parked up every week and, and no support in place. These are, are some of the key providers for our economy and have been left very much um, to fend for themselves. And I, I totally appreciate that not all hauliers are in the same position and they recognise that themselves. And I think that's why we need to look at this um, and, and develop a, a bespoke um, response to dealing with that issue. But I think it, it is important to realise that you know, the, the economy minister has made very, very clear that it's not up to her to lead any intervention for the road transport in industry as this would be considered under the uh, Department for Infrastructure. And as a committee, that is why we're here today, because we have responsibility for these sectors. And I think it's important that we came together to raise the concerns, because it has been to and fro for far too long. And, and you know, the, the people are just frustrated. They're fed up. They can't see a way out of this. And we're, we're hitting Brexit right in the face now. We're less than six months away from a deadline, which is another um, major challenge coming down the road. Did you never get wet? Uh, no. Um, the, the, last, the last thing I'm just going to read in, in relation to driving instructors, the, the issues that I've been getting, and last week in particular, since the announcement that they could go back to work, even though they've never been told that they can't work, um, was more around this confusion of how, how the, that pans out in reality. Um, they are seeking clear guidance from the Minister on that, and that is the message that they have been given. I've been contacted from people from Ballymena, Belfast, and as well as my own constituency, because it hasn't been clear. And whilst they've been signposted to guidance, they still feel very much that examiners are being, are being told to do different things. So what is the difference? Why, why are they being said they can go back to work, but examiners can't? What is the difference when they're working in the exact same environment? So rather than, than um, going back over the same points, they're just the key things that I wanted to raise. I think it's important that we um, recognise that the people are fed up. There's, this is not politic, and this is ensuring that people get this, this, the right support and guidance that they deserve. And I um, 
I'm in, in support of the motion, so I should have said that. Thank you. Mr. Paul Fruit. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I, I sit and listen to this debate being outside of the Committee for Infrastructure, but nonetheless very supportive of any committee that identifies a problem and then tries to deal with it in a very constructive way. And if that means bringing a motion to this House, so be it, so that we all can debate. And I am very thankful for the proposer and the committee in itself for bringing this, uh, highlight, highlighting this issue to the floor of this Assembly Chamber. Because what I know, being an MLA of North Antrim, is that haulage companies have been dramatically and drastically let down. If haulage companies had had the same attitude as some of our ministers in this place, with a can't-do attitude, where would we all be with regards to food supply and medicine? And those haulage companies have had to work through thick and thin, looking after their own staff, their own lorry drivers and their health and safety, trying to get from A to B with all these drastic barriers put in place, and they still fulfil their orders. They still fulfil their commitment to the people of Northern Ireland. Well, would it not be great if we could say that of the executive and of some of our ministers in this place, who have been slow to react in the middle of this crisis when there has been so many, so much good done? We have ministers, still ministers in this place, who have a can't-do attitude, and that's not good enough. And a comment that was made, I think it was uh, Ms. Kelly, about about committees being of one voice. You can't have it both ways. You either want a scrutiny committee or you do not. You want to get into the hard detail or you do not. And that's one thing that this House needs to make and sure is that the scrutiny committees in this place work efficiently and effectively. And no, well, you see, this is about an order and a code in this House that when a member doesn't give way to other members, why then should she see fit for members to give way to her? And I think that's a very good principle that we should all remember in this House when giving way. And I give away a lot in this House. Can I just say that it's very bad when a party, a particular party, any party, becomes a defence mechanism for their own minister in a scrutiny committee. It makes the minister look bad. And you know something? We've had the finance minister in this House many times telling us when we have asked them about the 59 million that's sitting here, it's now down to 29 million. This money's sitting here to support transport, and we can't unlock it. The haulage companies looking in see it, and they can't unlock it to give support to them. The finance minister has told us, where is the bid? Where is the bid? I'm waiting for a bid. That bid hasn't come. And why has that bid not come? These haulage companies seize this money. They see the money sitting there. They see the support. It's not as if we have no money left. It's not as if the coffers are dry. This money is sitting there and it's so annoying. It is so annoying. So let's forget about can't do attitudes. Can I say that as been on the finance committee, or I've chased the finance minister up and down these corridors and he's been hit with scandal after scandal. And can I say that he's actually looking quite good now with regards to the finance the minister for infrastructure. He's actually qu looking quite good at this moment in time, where he comes and tells this House he's waiting for a bid. He would like to support these, these businesses, but there is no bid. And there is a fundamental question. I think it was Mr Alistair who raised this. A fundamental issue around the executive and how it performs and how it functions. If this money is sitting here, dropped down on high from Barnet Consequentials, and yet we can't even get together to unlock it, it's not as if we have to raise it. It's not as if we have to find some mechanism to raise taxes or rates. It's sitting there. It's sitting there ready to be used and spent to what it's designed to do. And yet there's a reluctance to support these industries. Why is there a reluctance to support these industries? Industries that have kept going through thick and thin, providing food and medicines for us, who have looked after their staff, some who are very worried about going back to work or being in work because of the COVID-19 situation. And yet we can't find it in ourselves, this executive and this minister, to bring forward a bid, a bid where she, it will not burden her current financial package, the money that she's got at the minute. It would not burden that because this money is sitting here just to be moved from an unlocked position to her department so that she could furnish and support these industries. 
Yes, yes, I will. Unless, of course, there's another agenda. Unless the other agenda is to keep that 29 million for something else. Transwink has already had something of that order. Still needs more money. Does the member think that there might be prioritisation going on in which the haulage sector is the loser? The member has an additional minute. Yes, the, the, the member raises a very valid question that we all should be posing here today and asking this minister. What is the priority? And if it's not the haulage company after all they have done for this country, for Northern Ireland PLC over the last number of months, what is the priority? And why will you not bring forward a bid for financial support for taxi services, for haulage companies and for all the other companies that have been let down in this in this pandemic. And that's a question that we have to pose. It's the right of this Assembly and this scrutiny committee to ask these hard questions of our ministers. And I'm glad that this debate has been brought forward here today. And I thank the member. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. The Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1 p.m. today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. The first item of business when we return will be question time. This item of business will continue after question time when the next contribution will come from Mrs Martina Anderson. Thank you. We return now to the debate on the committee motion. And the next listed speaker is Mrs Martina Anderson. I would like to speak in favour of the motion and against the amendment. It has been three months since we went into lockdown, and now that we are hopefully coming out uh, this phase of it at the other end and towards economic recovery, our taxi industry is on its knees. Not a single penny has been put aside for a dedicated scheme that could offer financial support to taxi drivers who have fallen through the gaps of nearly every single financial scheme on offer. Although some taxi drivers have been able to avail of the self-support and self-employment scheme, many have been unable to do so. For those that have accessed some support, they have been burdened by heavy operational costs. The Minister for Infrastructure, whose department is responsible for transport policy in the North, states that her responsibility is only for the regulation of the sector. However, I believe that she has a wider responsibility to represent the interest of the transport sector during these unprecedented times and should not just leave these massive issues at the doors of other departments. Nicholas says it's Diane's responsibility. Diane says it's Nicholas's responsibility. A transport industry see a bickering game of ministerial ping pong, all the while our taxi drivers, hard working individuals, struggling to pay their bills, put food on the table and support their families. This is akin to firefighters arguing about who should operate the hose whilst the fire burns on and the building burns behind them. I am proud to support this motion and proud to support the taxi drivers in Derry, Mrs Kelly, if she's in the room. Uh, despite what was said, it isn't just about North and West Belfast, and even if it was, they deserve support. The taxi drivers support across the North are looking for support. We have seen other departments work together to put financial support in place, such as, for instance, the 12 million package for the emergency child care providers from the health and the education ministers. Education has the policy, but health has the legal authority. The taxi sector feel left behind during one of the darkest times. Their issues have been kicked from pillar to post, with the minister with the responsibility not advancing a cross-departmental uh, scheme, not taking ownership, not taking a uh, uh, champion this and not giving the lead. And this is what the taxi industry and many, many others are calling for. Behind the words of the motion today, there is a reality that our taxi drivers face every morning when they wake up. 
and every night when many of them lie awake, unable to sleep because of this extreme stress and anxiety caused by having absolutely no support. They have been pushed into a precarious financial position during a period of extreme uncertainty, which has severe repercussions on their mental and physical health. Taxi drivers are crying out for help. They came to Stormont last week to make their voices heard after months of frustration and passing the parcel. It's time that you, Minister, showed leadership. I also support this motion because since the beginning of May, I have been doing my utmost to fight for one of my constituents in Derry, a recently self-employed taxi driver who has not had a single penny of support. I lobbied HMRC on the self-employment income support scheme, but they were unwilling to help. I asked Minister Nicola Mallon in May to put a scheme in place for all taxi drivers, but she said it's not her responsibility. At the infrastructure and the TEO committees, we discussed Minister Dodds extending the hardship fund to those recently self-employed, like my constituent, my constituent, but as of yet, there's no clarity on that. The Minister, as a Minister responsible for transport policy, needs to take the lead. She needs to work on a cross-departmental basis, as other Ministers have done and demonstrated that they have done. She needs to bring forward a costed proposal for the formation of guidance and financial support. Minister, you need to roll up your sleeves, get active, seek the support and guidance that the taxi drivers, the haulage companies, the driving instructors and bus operators so desperately need and actually deserve. Thank you. The next person on my list is Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Mr. McCrossan will have four minutes because of the amount of time that's left, so um, probably an idea not to take an intervention, Mr. McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I was lining up for the interventions for this. Um, I first of all welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate. It is an important one, and I agree with the substance of the motion. Uh, that there are substantial gaps in support for taxi drivers, driving instructors and bus companies. I want to put it on record that transport sectors have been very important in us getting through this pandemic, and many people working in transport have been key workers in every sense in ensuring vital medical supplies are delivered to the vulnerable, in ensuring our supermarkets are appropriately stocked, and in ensuring that many elderly and sick people were able to attend appointments, scans and other medical procedures. They should be recognised here in this chamber for the vital work they have done and for the vital work they continue to do. They should not be subject to a political point scoring exercise where uh, it is clearly a cross cutting issue that needs to be dealt with by the executive. Not pointing the finger at my colleague, Mr Deputy Speaker, Minister Malm, saying you must do this when people rightly know in this chamber and in particular on the Infrastructure Committee that it is not the responsibility of Minister Mallon to address this issue in terms of grant funding to bail out taxi drivers, haulage or others. So I am not sure as to why two parties in particular, Mr Deputy Speaker, are perched up like two hummingbirds today, singing from the same hymn sheet about whether, no, I, I won't, uh, whether uh, uh, and who is responsible for uh, the uh, grants been rolled out. I, I note that Mr Boylan today jumped to his feet, Mr Prince the Deputy Speaker, and acknowledged that it is a cross-cutting exercise, but in the same breath said he was not going to support the amendment, the amendment that actually provides a resolution to this issue and ensures that there is some delivery. I am at least pleased that his colleague, Ms Anderson, acknowledges that it is a cross-cutting issue and that it has to be resolved by the executive. And Mr Frew, I often listen to your interventions in debates, but today I'm somewhat worried about the intervention you made. And I'm actually alarmed because you said there are plenty of money in the coffers. They have not dried up. Well, I'm sure I would like to think other members of this House the same, and those watching, that given the lessons of RHA, those are a bit of a very loose statement to be making. And I'm sure it would give Sam McBride much to write about when he looks at how money has been spent beyond COVID-19 if that is the attitude of certain parties as to how money, public money is to be ruled out. I would hope lessons will be learned. I, I won't. I won't. Um, given the, the DUP and Sinn Féin logic, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, it would almost suggest that because 
For instance, the councils are responsible for the granting of licenses for pubs. Is, uh, is that, does that mean that we're expecting, given your logic, that councils should also pay the grants for bailing out pubs and businesses? We need to get to the facts, and the facts are the Department for Infrastructure statutory functions do not include the power to create grant support for hardship or loss of income to those sectors. You just know that. So why are we standing in this House today pointing the finger, you need to resolve this, Minister Malm, you need to resolve this, your department needs to resolve it, when in actual fact this could be resolved at the executive and should be resolved at the executive, Mr. Prince of Speaker, given that there is a considerable amount of money that has been returned from businesses that have not availed of the grants that were put out there during the last number of months. So if we're serious about delivering for those in the haulage industry, taxi drivers and driving instructors, then let's work together to do it instead of pointing the finger across this chamber, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at ministers who have worked very hard to ensure that the voices of those who have fell through the stools have been heard very clearly throughout this entire pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call the Minister for Infrastructure, Ms. Nicola Mallon, who will have up to 15 minutes to respond to the issues raised in this debate. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I would like to thank members for their contribution to today's uh, debate. This is an extremely important issue, and while there has been much confusion, today's debate has given me a welcomed opportunity to clarify my role, remit, and powers, and the actions I have taken to date within my responsibilities to provide assistance to the industries highlighted in this motion. I hope that in setting out the facts, those who have accused me and my department of abandonment, of not stepping up or coming up with ideas, of a lack of leadership, of having a can't-do attitude, will reflect and see it as unfair. As the committee chair rightly pointed out, I have introduced a number of measures to ease the regulatory burden on hauliers and taxi drivers to assist them during this crisis. I will now turn to these before addressing the issue of guidance and financial support. As regulator of the taxi industry, a priority for me during the current public health emergency has been two-way communication with the industry on regulatory issues that need to be addressed. My officials and I have been in regular and ongoing contact with the industry, including with individual drivers and operators, and through open letters to the industry to ensure maximum reach. I recently met with the delegation of drivers outside this building and I listened to their concerns. I have put in place a number of measures to support the industry during this pandemic. I have brought forward coronavirus regulations to ensure the issue of a six-month taxi vehicle licence automatically and free of charge to vehicles whose previous licence expired between the 10th of March 2020 and the 9th of October 2020. All licences have now been issued. Driver CPC training providers are also now authorised to deliver taxi periodic training remotely via online video platforms. This enables drivers to continue to undertake some training online. With regards to medicals, following discussions with the Department of Health and the British Medical Association, the BMA and GPs have agreed to support and prioritise the processing of medical forms for those key workers who need them to renew their licences. In addition, and with effect from the 26th of May 2020, taxi drivers who do not have a medical condition to declare will have their taxi driver's licence renewed without a medical report. For the haulage industry throughout this crisis, I have pressed for recognition that maintaining our transport network is essential to safeguarding food security and to ensuring that critical goods continue to be delivered. I have put in place a range of measures to support the freight sector. This includes introducing a range of regulatory measures and a suspension of all MOT tests for commercial vehicles and relaxations of other requirements in areas such as CPC, tachographs, medical assessments and planning restrictions. An EU regulation came into effect on 4 June 2020 and enables the extension of the validity of certificates and licences to support those transport operators and individuals that, owing to the coronavirus restrictions, are having difficulties fulfilling certain administrative formalities before the expiry of the relevant deadlines. These measures supplement or supersede announcements I have already made in relation to driver CPC, driving licences, tachographs, 
and road transport operator financial standing. On the 25th of June 2020, the UK Government announced that they will suspend the heavy goods vehicle levy for a year from effect from 1 August 2020, as it is recognised that the haulage industry is critical to restarting the economy as the pandemic begins to subside. This suspension applies here and will provide further much-needed assistance. A number uh, of members, uh, Jim Allister, Cahill Boylan and others, have referred to the financial package secured for ferry operators. In a second, it is important to be aware of the facts as they are very relevant to the motion brought forward by some in the committee today. My department did not devise this package or administer it. I worked alongside ministerial colleagues to make the case to Department for Transport and UK Treasury. They devised a financial scheme which the executive agreed to jointly fund. This is a pertinent point which I will return to. To support private coach operators, my officials have held weekly meetings with industry representatives while all permit holders were issued with a letter reassuring them their permits would be safe in the event their services were withdrawn temporarily. I have also met with industry representatives and I recognise the huge financial difficulties they are facing as a result of the COVID crisis. Given their key role, not least to our tourism sector, I believe it is right and I very much support the fact that private tour operators are a key work stream of focus within the Department for Economy's COVID recovery work. My department is, as members have also highlighted, responsible for regulating the approved driving instructor and approved motorcycle instructor industry through the DVA. It does not, however, employ driving instructors or motorcycle instructors in the capacity of delivering driving instruction and therefore has no remit to suspend their services for public health reasons or determine when they might return to work. Mr Buchanan highlighted the point that he felt that an email circulated by DVA a few Saturdays ago had caused confusion among the sector. That email was important because during that weekend a number of elected representatives had indicated to driving instructors that they could recommence and resume services in line with close contact services. I felt it was important that I clearly communicated with them the case. The Executive Office confirmed that the regulations do not currently prevent driving lessons from taking place. If it is safe to do so for both instructors and their customers, then they should, and that is what the DVA communicated to the driving instructors whose data we held. Throughout the crisis, the Registrar for ADIs and AMIs in the DVA has provided regular updates to the industry and has signposted them to the latest public health advice on social distancing and safe working practices and advice on financial support. I accept the point of members are saying that they felt that communication could have been better and I will always seek to improve things where I can and will take that back and feed it to my officials. On the 23rd of June, however, the Registrar met with industry stakeholders and the group, the Northern Ireland Approved Instructor Council, to provide further updates, address their queries in relation to the planned reinstatement of services and listen to their concerns, including dates for resumption of driving and vehicle tests, extension of theory test pass certificates and safe working practices. And I understand this meeting was welcomed by the industry. I appreciate the frustrations felt by our ADIs and AMIs during these uncertain times, and the DVA will continue to provide regular updates to the industry to inform them of any relevant changes to services safely that may have an impact on their business. And I can assure them my officials are working to resume car and lorry driving tests as quickly as possible because we recognise the importance of that to their industry and custom. I will now turn to the issue of financial support to the taxi, haulage, private bus coach and driving instructor sectors. Like many members in this House, regardless of our party political background, we are all very aware of the hardship and challenges facing these sectors. There are financial assistance schemes currently on offer, but I, like you, remain concerned for those who fall outside their scope. In fact, since this crisis hit, more than any other minister, I have been raising the issue of the impact of COVID-19 on these sectors with executive colleagues. I have shared a number of my correspondences to executive colleagues with the committee. It has also been made clear that my statutory functions do not include the power to grant uh, to create grant support for hardship or loss of income for these sectors. DFI carries regulatory responsibility for these businesses and could only make grants available in relation to regulatory matters. 
This is defined in statute. As I stated at the committee meeting on the 29th of April 2020, existing taxi legislation, and I'm referring to section 51 of the Taxi Act 2008, it does not extend to providing general financial support grants to the taxi industry in times of hardship and to cover lost income. This is, not simply, this is simply not just my opinion, as one member put it. I sought legal advice from my officials to check this, and it has confirmed my limited varies in this regard. However, to help push the issue of financial support for the taxi industry forward, I contacted Minister Murphy and Minister Dodds on the 20th of March 2020, seeking information and advice as to whether there was specific support and financial assistance that the industry could access. In my emails, I indicated that I was keen to discuss the issue with them. Follow-up emails to Minister Dodds on the 14th of April and the 12th of May sought an update on guidance for social distancing for the industry. I would advise that in his response dated the 30th of March, Minister Murphy indicated some of the measures which would directly assist the taxi industry, both self-employed individuals and those running taxi operations. These included the measures announced by the UK Chancellor to support the self-employed impacted by coronavirus through the Coronavirus Self-Employment Income Support Scheme. This scheme provides for a taxable grant being paid to the self-employed or partnerships which have suffered a loss of income worth 80% of their profits up to a cap of £2,500 per month. For taxi operators, he advised of help available through zero rates bills for April, May and June and the opportunity for small businesses to avail of a grant under the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme. Furthermore, I wrote to the Executive on the 26th of March and then again on the 28th of March, stressing that there was a need to ascertain what financial support could be made to the industry. In both memos, I also suggested that options be explored as to how the industry could be repurposed during the COVID-19 crisis to help the vulnerable staying at home. In addition, in an email to the Executive Office on the 28th of March, I stated that I had been contacted by many within the industry and stressed the need for TEO stress the need to TEO for urgent redeployment and assistance for this sector. I have also written to the Minister for Communities to explore the idea of how taxi drivers can play their part in taking the pressure off our vital services by helping the most vulnerable in our communities by, for example, delivering groceries, food parcels, medicines and other critical supplies to those shielding and the vulnerable. In terms of financial support for the haulage industry, the Department for Transport has had regular engagement with both the Road Haulage Association and Freight Transport Association to understand the up-to-date picture for road hauliers at a local and UK-wide level. Work along these lines is being led by DERA. Given their role in food security, they are the lead in identifying the evidential basis for specific financial intervention to the haulage industry, and my, my officials continue to work with DERA and with other colleagues to support this work. I understand that at a time of stress, people need to know where to go for help, and it is very important that they are pointed to the right place. I have set out the steps that I have taken in terms of my remit as a regulator, but also how I have reached out to other executive colleagues, given their roles and responsibilities, to provide support to the industries that we are very much focused on today. I was therefore very pleased to see the Minister for the Economy bring forward a paper to the executive that included options to enhance support to the very industries that we are talking about today. Within her paper, the Economy Minister has outlined options that would exceed the extension of the hardship funds to include self-employed businesses with no employees. In her own paper, the Minister for the Economy acknowledges that this would encompass the taxi industry and also possibly the haulage, driving instruction, private bus and coach sectors. I have written to Minister Dodds to confirm that I am very supportive of this option because I recognise the hardship being felt by those who have not been able to avail of the hardship schemes currently on offer. A number of members had highlighted the fact that as regulator I hold data and information. Prior to this recent paper uh, and since this paper, I have reiterated my offer to provide whatever information or data I hold as regulator to ensure that we can communicate with those who need to have assistance. Surely, this is something that all of us in this House can support. 
as Mr Boylan and Mr, uh, Mr Moore and uh, M Martina Anderson have highlighted in their contribution, and I thank them for it. This issue is a cross-cutting one. As Minister for Infrastructure, I do not have the VARES to provide uh, financial hardship and assistance schemes. But what I have been determined to do is do what I can within my remit and working with others. So the question today that we have all been united on is the need for a proposal to come before the Executive. That cost of proposal has been brought to the Executive. It was brought recently by the Minister for, for the Economy in line with the other hardship schemes that her department and the Department for Finance and UK Treasury have announced to date. As Mr Beggs and Mr uh, Andrew Muir highlighted, there is careful work required to ensure that any scheme that is devised provides assistance to those who have not been able to avail of it to date to avoid the double accounting caution that Mr Beggs raised. There is no ping pong here. I can speak for myself, and I have continuously tried to reach out because I want to ensure that all of those who have fallen through the cracks can get the support that they deserve. An executive effort is what is required, an executive effort that is highlighted in this amendment. The best way, in my humble opinion, for this Assembly to show its support for these sectors is therefore to support the amendment ahead of the executive's consideration of future hardship schemes. That is what I remain committed to doing. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I now call on Sinead Bradley to wind on the amendment, and she will have five minutes to do so. Ms. Bradley. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, as Dolores Kelly uh, in the proposal to the motion repeated the fact that the Minister for Infrastructure does not have the legal virus to provide the financial assistance called for in this motion. Uh, Roy Beggs and Andrew Moore both correctly referred to another fact that many sole traders and self-employed people with no employees across many sectors remain outside the executive support schemes to date. And I believe it is obvious to all the members that a body of work needs to be done to close that gap uh, that has been created by the schemes to date, which have been led by the Department for the Economy. Mr Beggs rightly warned the need for such work to continue to be channelled through the executive as an assurance that double accounting cannot happen as funds are rolled out. It is important to note, however, that this work does not solely rest exclusively with the Minister for the Economy. It will require a cross-cutting effort by all ministers and executive table to ensure that all those sole traders and individuals who have yet to be supported by the executive are included. This must, and I have no doubt, will include the taxi, haulage, driving instruction and private hire bus and coach sectors, which are in urgent need of help. And I say I have no doubt because I know, as does every member of the Committee for Infrastructure, that Minister Mallon has ensured that their plight has been heard by all executive colleagues. During her contributions, Ms Kelly listed a catalogue of communications repeated by the Minister that all executive ministers are aware not just of the plight of these transport workers, but also the fact that the Department for Infrastructure does not have the legal varies to provide financial assistance. A fact I won't have time for an intervention, apologies. A fact that I feel compelled to repeat as it appears to be lost on some members of the House. Sinn Féin in their contributions today tied themselves in knots. In front of my eyes, they shredded the main motion when Mr Boylan placed on record that he agreed with the limitations on the Varys issue. The member for Nuri Armagh went on to record to say that she states and recognises that the executive have a role to play in reaching a solution. Yet Sinn Féin then go on to state that they cannot support the very amendment which gives recognition to these two facts. I won't, we set the tone earlier on that, on that basis. The amendment, as outlined by Daniel McCrossan, moves this debate closer to a resolution. It cuts through the he said, she said arguments. The amendment set a course for a swifter resolution, but Sinn Féin cannot support it. The DUP have gone on record today to say that they want to see a swift solution and they want to not to be playing party politics. Yet they fail to support the amendment. I will I'll give you one moment. Yeah, I know you've been trying. Thank the member for allowing me to intervene. And can I apologise to Mr. Boyle and Mr. Mrs. McAveen uh, for interrupting their team huddle in the, in the canteen below earlier. 
Will the member take up the opportunity to comment on Mr Boylan's apparent complete U-turn on this issue? For weeks now, he has been tabling written questions to the economy minister on what her department was doing for the coach and taxi sector. Just when did he decide that, that was the responsibility of the infrastructure minister? Maybe someone told him to lay off the economy minister and turn his attention elsewhere. Is this just an example of the DUP Sinn Féin ruling elite class absolving themselves of responsibility as usual? Mr McNulty, you are consuming all of your colleagues' time. Ms Bradley. On record. Sorry, apologies. We will not have shouting up the benches. I enjoy a good heckle as much as the next person. Uh, don't get me wrong on that. Mr McNulty, intervention should be brief. You consumed up... And, uh, well, it might have been brief in Armagh, but it's not brief here. Um, you consumed an awful lot of your colleagues' time I call Ms Bradley, who has about a minute and a half left. Thank you. So the DUP will not support the motion. The very amendment, apology, the amendment which defuses the political point scoring and offers a real solution. Let's be clear, the amendment sets out a clear course of finding a quicker solution. The DUP have apparently a pre-prepared position that they have declared and will continue to align with Sinn Féin on this, regardless of the facts. The DUP want the Minister for Infrastructure to make a bid for funding that they know she cannot spend. How would that make those who are in need feel today? It's a ridiculous proposal, which reveals a lot about the consideration that went behind the motion put before us today. Can you just imagine the prolonged kerfuffle that would, and the process that would be required if such a bid was made and it wasn't made in a cross-cutting way? Mr Muir, we might have time to watch that fish learn to climb a tree. A cheap political point score, that's what this motion was. And if anybody was sincere in doing anything else, they should have no problem supporting the amendment to the motion. In fact, I go further. If you supported the need to bring this motion to the House today, then there is a moral duty on you to support the amendment which sets clarity on how to move this matter to a final resolution. Uh, if members you are time, sincere, members thank time you. Is up. Uh, I'll just make a closing comment. Okay. I would ask those to just step up and represent the people they claim to be representing today in supporting the amendment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee for Infrastructure, Mr David Hilditch, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Mr Hilditch. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I rise to obviously support the motion and thank the members who have took part in the debate for their contributions and the interest on in what is a very important matter, there's no doubt. This is an issue which has had a massive impact on the lives of individuals and businesses severely impacted by COVID-19. The Chair of the Committee and my party colleague, Michelle Michael Fein, gave an overview of the Committee's consideration of the issues facing taxi, bus and coach hire haulage and the driving instructor sectors. I will speak on a number of the issues coming out of that debate before summarising the views of other contributors. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that despite an amendment being made uh, to the committee motion, it is clear that there is no disagreement about the desire, uh, face and the dire situation facing these sectors. Everyone here today recognises the concerns of the individuals and the organisations involved and the impact on their lives and that of their families and businesses that they have invested time, money and effort into building. Therefore, it is a good starting point that we all recognise the problems and we know the support is needed. This is a good place to be and I thank all contributors today for their words to that effect. Mr Andrew Muir, who also supported the amendment to the motion, sorry, sorry, that's, that's why Andrew, uh, Dolores, Kelly should be, Dolores Kelly, who laid the motion, has outlined the Department of Infrastructure has indeed brought in a number of measures to assist those suffering an economic fallout uh, from the pandemic. She adds that all of us have uh, her gratitude to the workers and, and these sectors who have worked throughout the worst of the last few months. Ms Kelly outlined that she believes that the impetus for this motion was from the taxi industry in North and West Belfast, a point that I do not recognise personally myself because indeed I had been lobbied locally in my own constituency by taxi drivers. 
She has outlined the schemes that are available, and some of these industries have availed of them, and that these schemes have been made available by the Department of the Economy and the Department of Finance. She supports the views of her party colleague and Minister of Infrastructure that the Department for Infrastructure has no support or power to provide that financial package. She casts blame on the ferry companies for not sharing uh, their support uh, through, down through to the hauliers, which is, again, is probably something that really should be looked at as well. And she directs taxi drivers and driving instructors to the Department of Economy web website if they need help. Dolores Kelly has noted that the Minister wrote to both Finance and Economy Ministers and wrote to the Executive asking for financial support and what could be made available. She finished by urging the Executive to fill this obvious gap in funding and accepted the point made by Jim Allister that this was a problem in totality for the Executive. Andrew Muir also supported the amendment to the motion. Uh, he noted that there were disparities across these industries and cited the hauliers as a sector where some had remained busy uh, during the crisis. He asked for better coordination across the departments. Andrew noted that there was concern for the furlough scheme that would come to an end and something needed to be done there as well. And he said that the situation was stark and that the uh, Department of Infrastructure and uh, HMT want to provide support. He said coach operators were often reliant on tourism and that there needs to be a coordinated uh, help for the tourism sector, which hopefully will be coming. He said the motion uh, is false in raising hopes for the Department of Infrastructure within these sectors, maybe something that we all don't see eye to eye on. Uh, Mr Storey's intervention, he made the observation that local coach operators who he talked to uh, were looking to DFI for regulation and indeed financial assistance. Keith Buchanan supported the motion and noted that the COVID-19 crisis had massively impacted on all these sectors and their activities. He said that there had been no clear guidance in relation to PPE for taxis and that they had been left to their own devices very much. He said taxi drivers, uh, for it is hard for them to socially distance and they are self-employed and they need to work. He made the point that the Minister of Finance had not yet uh, received any bids for support for the taxi industry from the Department of Infrastructure. He highlighted that the cancellation of holidays by coach will mean it will be difficult to survive, that operators are investing heavily in their operations and costs still need to be covered. They have 68 hours in reduction uh, for testing as soon as bookings are able to commence again. The haulage industry is suffering totally. Liz Kimmins, in support of the motion, asked the Minister of Infrastructure to lead on these issues and provide clear guidance. She said it was unfair to say that the companies were from North and West Belfast, a point already made. She said haulage is hemorrhaging. Hundreds of vehicles are parked up each week, and not all hauliers in the same position. Indeed, it is costing tens of thousands of pounds for those lorries to be parked up on a weekly basis. It is important to realise, too, that it is not up to just to the Economy Minister, but for the Minister of Infrastructure to champion the cause. Paul Frew said he supported any committee that identifies a problem and brings it to the Chamber. Uh, the North Antrim haulage companies that he had spoken to were left out, and uh, where would they get their food and medicine supplies if it was not for those few drivers who were still working? Middle of this crisis, uh, Ministers just can't have a, a, a can't do attitude, was Mr. Frew's catch line. He said that the finance minister had 59 million, uh, and now that was now 29 million for transport, and can't unlock it. And that he is waiting for the bid. He asked why the bid had not come. Mr. Allister questioned the 29 million had already been earmarked for something else potentially. Cathal Boylan made the point that the committee. Uh, meeting when the motion was agreed, there was unanimous, a unanimous decision uh, in the absence of committee of Mrs Kelly and that Mr Beggs voted in support of the motion. Mr Boylan notes that these industries look to the infrastructure minister as their minister really. They look uh, to her for answers and to her to bring forward proposals and that the committee for infrastructure support them and not just regulations. 
He called on the Minister to draw proposals that might be discussed with the Executive and get the support for the Minister of Finance and the Minister of the Economy. He said that the Minister of Infrastructure found uh, time to work with airports and noted that she had stated that her powers were limited for airports, but she managed to secure some funding by working with the uh, DFT. Roy Beggs uh, supported the amendment to the motion. He, he made the point that some, have, uh, that some have been affected to varying degrees and that to avoid duplicating schemes, it should be a well coordinated uh, scheme by the executive to get the support uh, of the economy, minister, and how it impacts on other parts of the economy. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's all regulated correctly. Uh, Martina Anderson supported the motion, pointing out that. No scheme had been put in place for taxi drivers, and many had fallen through uh, the other schemes, fallen through the cracks. Uh, the minister had a, she said the minister had a, a wider responsibility, and the Department of Economy and Infrastructure are blaming each other. She said the taxi drivers need some uh, want to take control and give leadership. That they are suffering uh, mentally and physically uh, due to that. Uh, not knowing. She talked about a constituent who has not been able to get any support or work during this difficult time. Uh, she also stated the Minister needs to take the lead and bring forward cost of proposals. Daniel McCawson agrees with the substantive substantion of the motion that the sectors uh, need help. They should not be subjected to a point scoring exercise, which most of us believe it's not. This is a matter for the executive. Uh, he points out that the facts are that the role of DFI is not to develop grants. He pointed out that the money has been returned from grants that haven't been taken up. The minister wanted to clarify uh, her powers and facts. Uh, she said that she had uh, met with sectors and had brought forward schemes and outlined a range of schemes and alluded to those during her during her speech. Those included the likes of the medical licences and suspension of MOTs, etc. She spoke of the financial challenges uh, of the sector mentioned in the motion, but outlined that she uh, can only make grants on a, reg a regulatory basis. She outlined her communications with the executive and all other ministers. Members, it is time for our government to show leadership at this time when actions of certain ministers and members have undermined the authority of the executive. We must lead and recognise that each and every industry will need tailored help, support and guidance. Can I ask the member to bring his remarks? Okay, one please. size fits all it is, is not suitable for moving forward, and we have to do everything in our power to support these industries. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Dolores Kelly, Daniel McCrossan and Sinead Bradley be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any. No. Aye. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place must not come to the chamber. The House will divide. Order. Members, please resume their seats. Order. Before I put the question again, I would remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Dolores Kelly, Daniel McCrossan and Sinead Bradley be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any. I beg your pardon. Looking for my instructions. Here we are. Do we have tellers? <laughs> Order. Order. 
The tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Sinead Bradley and Daniel McCrossan. The tellers for the nose are Cathal Boylan and David Hilditch. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It is important that during any division, social distancing in the Chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask members, to do the, I would ask members the following. Any members in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division is concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the Chamber until the division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the Chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Can I ask members to resume their seats, please? I will ask the clerk to read the result. 83 members voted, 30 members voted aye, 53 members voted no. The amendment is not made. The amendment has not been made. Unfasten the doors. The question is that the motion as standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. Ms. Kelly aside, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs> if members would just take their ease for a moment, um, we'll just change the top table.